All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay. Um, very funny story. I'm just going to tell you right now that um, my uh, on my on my Tuesday on my Tuesday call, uh, I I left a joke hanging out there. I asked you to Google the name of the person so that you could um, <clears throat> figure out who the, who told that joke. Got a phone call from my brother last night who listens to everything I put out here. So very happy to hear from my brother. I never hear from my brother. He never calls me. I always have to talk to him through the podcast. Um, and he uh, he was wondering what the answer was. So if there's anybody out there that's still wondering what the what the uh, uh, who the comedian was that told that joke, um, you can check that out on my Tuesday call. Which I get. I have to tell everybody right now that my Tuesday call is now changing. We we uh, originally softly called it the the three things. And every topic would be, you know, the three things, blah, 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 blah. And uh, what I've decided to do, because I think it'd be a little bit more unique, is it's now going to become the multifamily law school, where we take on a fact pattern, we take on a case, we take on a, uh, a contract issue, anything like that. So if you have anything you can, uh, that you want to talk about, send it on over at charles at dobbinslaw.com and uh, I will get you at the top of the list for subject matter. But otherwise, I'm just going to uh, make uh, pull up a topic that I've had to deal with over the years and we can talk about it and see what uh, you know what you would do. But in today's call, listen, I'm telling you, we're doing the hotel to apartment conversions uh, and it's just amazing how much interaction we have with the zoning department. And, you know, we're seeing huge changes in zoning laws all across the country. Everywhere we go, oh, well, we're changing our zoning. Well, we're changing our zoning. Wow. What happened? And I got to tell you, folks, I'm, I've been kind of a, a historian on the zoning laws because of reading the book uh, by Richard Rothstein called The Color of Law. And that really has... Um, uh, has opened my eyes quite a bit to the issues that we have in this country uh, as it relates to de jure segregation. And you might think that's a big, oh, what is this term? What are we going to be talking about? I thought we were talking about zoning. Yeah, we are talking about zoning, and you're about to find out how those two terms are um, so negatively uh, related. Um, uh, my partner, Dave Peters, sent me over an article that I want to uh, go over here. The name of it was uh, The Hottest Trend in U.S. Cities, Changing Zoning Rules to Allow More Housing. And this was an NPR article, NPR.com, which I know I know what you're thinking. But David Peters, he's a good guy. He's a really good guy. I really like him. Uh, but occasionally he, he does he does go on the dark side. And he finds me articles on uh, NPR. I will forgive him. I will forgive him, especially because this time this uh, this article uh, had to do with something that is near and dear to all of our hearts. And it starts off. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase a lot of their article, so um, I I can't be canceled. I don't want anybody to try to put this presentation through a uh, through a, a fact checker or a plagiarism checker because I'd fail. I'd fail. But I'm attributing most of it to NPR. Some of it's mine, some of it's NPR. So they start off by saying America is in a housing crisis. From a recent NPR article, to ramp up supply of housing in communities, cities, and the, uh, to, oh, let me, let me rephrase. To ramp up supply of housing in communities, mm -hmm. cities are taking a fresh look at their zoning rules that spell out what can be built, built where and what can't. And many are finding that their old rules are too rigid, making it too hard and too expensive to build many homes. What's the solution? Zoning reform. Doesn't it drive you crazy that the people that created the problem are now the ones coming up with the novel ways to solve these problems? It's like the old saying that I say all the time, when you're being rid, ridden out of town on a rail, get in front of the crowd and make it look like you're leading the parade. Now, states, cities, and towns are crafting new rules that do things like 
allow multifamily homes in neighborhoods. They allow for building of accessory dwelling units or ADUs, or as normal people would always have said, in-law apartments. They get rid of parking requirements and or they increase the density of dwelling units per acre. Now, that last one is one that we come up against all the time in the hotel to apartment conversion business. But the big change, get a load of this, ending single family zoning and allowing two to three family units to be built in different neighborhoods. Folks, if you read Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, you would recognize this historic zoning law as being invented to keep the races apart. That's right. And I'm going to talk more about it later. The biggest perpetrator of racial discrimination has been our government, especially as it relates to housing laws and zoning laws, more importantly. But now they're, they're coming to Jesus. They're calling it a blueprint for housing affordability. Now back to NPR. What is the result according to one particular city that implemented these changes? For all the hubbub about duplexes and triplexes in former single family only areas, very few have been built. And one reason is that they still had to be the same size as the single family home, making them less feasible to build. So if I have a 1500 square foot house in a single family zone neighborhood, and I want to put up a duplex or a triplex, I can't increase the footprint. It still has to be a 1500 square foot place. Yeah, well, that's going to work. Let's map this out. Let's say that a state tells a city that they must increase the ability for developers to add more units to their housing stash. The city goes along with the state decree, but essentially in name only. Hey, we've increased the density of dwelling units per acre, but the square footage can't change. What good does that do? It makes the city forefathers think like, oh, we're doing great things for our community, when in actuality, it does nothing. Instead, what has happened is that the vast majority of new housing has been built in the form of mid-size apartment buildings with 20 or more units. Folks, if you're in the apartment business and you're thinking about possibly developing, this is the perfect niche size. And one person said on the NPR article, the zoning reforms made apartments feasible. They made them less expensive to build. And they were saying yes, the cities and towns were saying yes when builders submitted applications to build apartment buildings. So they got a lot of new housing in a short period of time. I'll give you an example. What happened in Houston? They reduced the minimum building lot sizes from 5,000 square feet to 1,400 square feet. That spurred a townhouse boom that helped increase the housing stock enough to slow the rent growth in the city. Now, you hear us talking about how rents have, have been flat or reducing in Houston but we haven't talked too much about that change in the zoning laws. And of course, it's important that the government change their mission statements too, so that they can sell these new changes to the unwashed masses like you and me. You know, what used to be known of as affirmative action is now being called DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. That way they can get it past those people who no longer support affirmative action after the United States Supreme Court's decision in the Students for Fair Housing versus Harvard case. Now, they've also changed the buzzwords as far as the zoning goes. The, the buzzwords for going from 5,000 square foot footprints to 1,400 square foot is called gentle density and that right now what we're trying to do by zoning changes is we're we're building the missing middle class housing and creating more choices all feel good terms for trying to get solve the problem that the government created on their own many years ago 
Where have we heard all this stuff before? NPR tells a story about a woman named Sarah Moran, who's 33 years old and moved from Houston to Minneapolis a few months ago, where she lives in a new 12-unit apartment building called the Sundial Building. The building is brick, three stories, and super energy efficient. And until just a few years ago, it couldn't have been built for one reason. There's no off-street parking. In other words, Sarah Moran and her children had no place to live a few years ago because the government had to make sure that she had housing that provided at least 1.4 parking spaces for her non-existent automobile that she couldn't afford in the first place because her housing costs were too high. And did you ever stop and ask yourself, why 1.4? Why not two? Why not 1.6? And let's go crazy. Why not zero? Think about that for a second. Parking spaces are essentially a commodity. And of course, location determines the true value of a parking space. But wherever you go, a parking space performs the exact same function, right? It's a parking space. No moving parts. It's not going to break. And there are companies that will open up to sell just that, a parking space. They're called parking garages. And did you ever wonder when that builder of that parking garage came before the zoning board, if he was asked to provide 1.4 dwelling units for every 10 parking spaces built, or maybe one new dwelling unit for every seven spaces he built? Of course not. That would be ridiculous. How could you ever ask a builder of a particular type of structure to build a structure with a product that is sold by another builder? Wait a minute, did I say that right? I think I did. I did say that right. It just sounded ridiculous. And that was my intent. It's called proving absurdity by being absurd. And that's what our government does. And that's why we're in the position that we're in now. NPR goes on to say that the sundial is the sort of building many cities want more of. Housing that offers options for people at different income levels in different stages of their lives in neighborhoods that already have amenities like restaurants and transit routes and possibly parking garages. NPR continues, they say, it's no accident that throwing out the parking rules was vital to the Sundial's construction. The elimination of parking requirements has been the most effective regulatory reform we've ever made. And a 2019 analysis by the New York Times looked at 11 U.S. cities and suburbs and found that in most of them, 75% or more of the residential land is zoned to allow only detached single family homes, no row homes, no apartments. In Connecticut, get a load of this one, in Connecticut, researchers found that three unit homes, three units are permitted by right on just 2.5% of the state's land. And that nine towns only allow single family housing. Remember what I said at the beginning about about segregation, de jure segregation? Let's get into that a little bit more. They said, we're really dealing with outdated and inequitable regulations. Inequitable, equity, DEI, that in too many places have really choked housing supply, said Angela Brooks, president of the America Planning Association which has made zoning reform one of its top priorities. You don't say, Angela. And how did we come to this end? I know the answer. Pick me. The answer, the reason why we are in this is because of one thing, racial discrimination, but not just any type of discrimination, 
de jure segregation and de jure discrimination. That means discrimination by law. You see, we're not born racists. It's a learned trait. And who has taught us how to be discriminatory? Our government. And if you don't believe me, well, let's take a little history lesson here. Per Wikipedia, and this is one of the lessons I learned from Richard Rothstein, the city of Louisville, Kentucky, great city. I actually have a, have a hotel under contract in Louisville. I plan on closing in April. Well, they were the ones that started it all, not intentionally, just so happened to be in Louisville. The city of Louisville had an ordinance that forbade any black person to own or occupy any buildings in an area in which a greater number of white persons resided and vice versa. That was their first attempt at zoning laws. And in 1915, William Morley, the prospective black buyer and an attorney for the National Association for the Advancement of Color People, made an offer to Charles H. Buchanan for his property in a predominantly white neighborhood. He based his offer on the following condition, and I quote, It is understood that I am purchasing the above property for the purpose of having erected thereon a house which I propose to make my residence, and it is a distinct part of this agreement that I shall not be required to accept a deed to the above property or to pay for said property unless I have the right under the laws of the state of Kentucky and the city of Louisville to occupy said property as a residence. Isn't it crazy that you even have to put that rule in there? So Buchanan, who happened to be a white man, accepted the offer. And when Worley did not complete the transaction, Buchanan brought an action in the Tran Chancery Court of Louisville to force him to complete the purchase. Worley argued that Louisville's ordinance prevented him from occupying the property, so it was of less value to him. Buchanan sued on the grounds that the ordinance was unconstitutional and he should receive full payment. Okay, let me just say as an aside, this looks to be one of those staged lawsuits. You know, kind of like Rosa Parks move, sitting in the front of the bus and Brown versus Board of Education. That's okay. I have nothing against staged, staged lawsuits. They make for great law. And in this particular, because typically, why would somebody take a, a housing transaction, the sale of real estate to the U.S. Supreme Court, unless there was something else there on that both parties were trying to prove? And I agree that that, that and I believe that that's what actually happened. So you might be wondering what the outcome was. Here, let me tell you. What did the U.S. Supreme Court decide? Well, they correctly said that this was in violation of Mr. Worley's constitutional rights and that Louisville's zoning ordinance was racist. So what happened as a result? The U.S. Supreme Court back in 1917 essentially gave every racist city planner in the country a roadmap on how to create racist zoning laws that did not violate the U.S. Supreme Court's description of racist zoning laws. How convenient. I couldn't imagine any other way that the court could have been more helpful to the cause of the racists. Let me give you some examples of how over the years, zoning laws have been used to segregate our citizenry. Officials passed, and this came from Richard Rothstein's book, Officials passed ordinances limiting certain neighborhoods to single-family homes. Remember, we're talking about what goes on in Connecticut, where only 2.5% have three units or more are allowed, 2.5% three, three, of the land can allow three-plus units. Officials passed ordinances limiting certain neighborhoods to single-family homes only to middle-income people because African Americans had been historically and systemically discriminated against in their job market, many were lower income and so could only afford housing in apartment buildings. Structures that were banned by these ordinances. The result was that areas zoned for single family homes stayed or became white areas 
while areas that allowed multiple family dwellings stayed or became African American. So in other words, the zoning wasn't explicitly racist, but instead was economically segregated, which essentially accomplished the same result. And let me give you another example. Certain areas and municipalities are zoned specifically for industry to protect residents from nuisances like noise or air pollution, to further segregate their cities in the wake of Buchanan v. Worley, city officials zoned areas near predominantly black neighborhoods for industry. This move lowered property values in those areas, thereby reducing the current residents' wealth and limiting their opportunities to move out. Have you heard of this life cycle of poverty? That's how it starts. And listen to this one. If a black family were wealthy enough, they could live in an upwardly mobile or economically zoned neighborhood. But in order to keep African Americans confined to particular neighborhoods, the federal government pursued, pursued a two-prong approach. First, it appraised areas that were majority African American as risky, as a process now known in the world as redlining, a process that was created by the federal government. Then it would deny loan guarantees and financial support to black families attempting to live outside those areas. The agency doing the denying was the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, I believe it was started back in 1935 created to increase home ownership by insuring private bank mortgages and facilitating more advantageous terms. The FHA systematically discriminated against black families. Their reasoning was that integration led to a reduction in property values. Folks, the FHA exists because of our money. It's not their money that they need to be protected the economic zoning. It's our money. And before Buchanan, people just lived where they wanted, completely integrated. The FHA began segregating them on high. Some bureaucrat in Washington took it upon himself to segregate neighborhoods that had, that had been integrated for years. So why is all this zoning changing happening now? And yes, I'm a little jaded. All right. I don't like what our government has done in many cases. I'm just calling balls and strikes here. So why is this happening now? It's happening now because those zoning laws that were causing all these problems today, those laws that have existed since 1917 need to change because they are hurting white people. Okay. Now don't fall off your seat. I just because of what I just said. But the fact is, my father, the greatest man I've ever known, said it years ago and was right then as it is now, said, just treat everyone the same and everyone will be fine. Well, we're finding out that because of institutionalized racism at the government level through de jure segregation, what goes around comes around. And the, now the government feels the need to solve the problem. The best thing they could do is just get out of our way and let us solve it on our own. So, so oh, what can you do to get up to speed? Here's what I'd like you to do. If you're in, in the multifamily business, if you're out there looking for deals, contact the local zoning department and find out what plans they have for modifying their current code. My, my city is changing all of their zoning maps and allowing for increased density in different areas. If that's the case, make sure you go around and find out what the impact will be on, on different parts of your, of your city. Maybe you can go out there and find an empty lot that could only support a single family unit in the past. And maybe you can put up a four or five unit townhome structure. Contact a local uh, um, uh, modular housing company. Out here, one that I highly recommend, and I recommend you go on their website and to check it out, is westchestermodular.com. Look at some of their apartment buildings that they put up or row houses they put up through, through um, modular building. It's amazing, absolutely beautiful, beautiful property. 
you might be able to drop those right into, into that lot because of the zoning changes. I've already seen it happening around my town all over the place. I think, geez, these guys were on top of it. So now I'm telling you to get on top of it and check out what the zoning laws are in your area so that you can figure out exactly what's happening. Um, so that is, uh, no, no, Francis, this has got nothing to do with opportunity zones. Though opportunity zones are a great, great opportunity. Uh, great, no I'm kidding. That's why they call them zones. No, that's not why they call them zones. Um, but yeah, check it out. Uh, uh, look around, find different areas, get to know what's going on in your area. M many of these, and of course, all these politicians are jumping on the bandwagon like, oh, yes, we're doing all these great things. Yeah, where have you been for the last 20 years when the Sarah Martins of the world couldn't find a place to live? Come on, guys. You can do better. You can do better. So that's that's my argument for today. Um, hello, John Racine. I hope you all enjoyed this. Am I right? Am I wrong? How do you feel? Did I go off the off the deep end when I when I called out as being like this is a uh, white people problem now? So oh no, now we're gonna solve it. Oh now we're gonna make it happen. Like come on, treat everybody exactly the same. That's the, that's the key to all of this. My father had it done. I I, I mean I remember, um, you know, my dad being a, an insurance agent for all those years. Um, uh, I, I insurance agent all those years. Uh, he. Let me see. There was one time um, that we drove down a road where there were a lot of mobile home parks. And, of course, you think mobile home, home parks, lower income, what have you. My dad, the insurance agent, says to me, I was in one of those mobile homes the other day, and the people gave me a check for $75,000. This was in 1976. Don't ask me how I remember that. But this was 1976, and the people had given my dad had checked for an annuity for $75,000 in a mobile home. My dad's response was, you just never can judge anybody. You always have to treat everybody exactly the same. And another example that I had, I read a book one time about the top car salesman in the country. This guy, and it's not a dealership I'm talking about. I'm talking about the actual best salesman. Uh, he wrote a book. and They asked him, why are you such a good salesman? And his answer was right on line with my dad. The guy said that when somebody comes through those doors, I always think I can sell them a car. I don't care who they are. I always think I can sell that person a car. He doesn't judge anybody. Treat everybody exactly the same. That's the key. All right, let's see what John Liberati has to say here. Looking at a property development of 30 units, the city is requiring us to pay the park authority for spaces for each unit. I think it's one point. Yes, exactly, John. John, there's a I before I came online, I was hoping to find, uh, I was hoping to find a uh, the link to a um, a particular uh, company, or no, it's actually like a it's a lobbying group. I think it's out in the western part of the country, but they they lobby everywhere. Where their whole job is to lobby cities and towns to get away, to do away with parking requirements and just don't even have them. And if you look at Minneapolis, my partner, David Peters, uh, it, it has his thumb on the pulse there. And he said, Minneapolis did away with all, all parking requirements. Just said, no, that's it. And, and at the first time you hear of that, you think that's nuts. But if you read about this public interest group or the lobbying group, and their attitude is like, you know what, from an economic standpoint, in a, in a fair market world, why should, why should a building developer have to be put into the business of selling parking spaces? That's not his business. Somebody else can do that better. So let somebody else do it. And, and then, of course, the question becomes, as you can see John, John types in here, he says, um, he says 1.5 spots per unit. John, why 1.5? I mean, you look at, oh, we, we're thinking about changing it to 1.2. Why? What's the arbitrary rule for why you want to switch it from 1.2 to 1.5? It doesn't make any sense. It just makes the Sarah Martins of the world ha find it harder to find a place to live. You know, it's going to be a, a, a part of where you live. 
if you want to live in a city with a car, well, it's your responsibility to go out and find parking. The cost of the parking shouldn't be baked into the rent. The cost of the parking should be your own personal responsibility and you pay somebody else to park your car. If I live in an apartment building in the city and I don't have a car, why should I have to subsidize your parking space? And that's exactly what's happening. So parking, we deal with this like right now on, on this deal in, in Louisville. Do you realize that if the building has bike racks or if it has it's on a bus line, we can have the parking requirement reduced? Oh, what a great idea. It just doesn't make any sense. And the other thing, too, is if you know we take a hotel. Uh, well, I'm hoping this is going to change. If we take a hotel, which typically has a one-to-one, -one, maybe a slightly less than one-to-one -one parking ratio, because think about it. If somebody's coming to stay for the night, they have one car. The, the whole family's not coming in, it, and it's a hotel room, so they're not really a whole lot of people. So we can live with a one-to-one. -one. But if you make it a dwelling unit where people sleep there long-term, night after night, more than 30 days, they now say you need more parking. Well, it's still the same size unit. It doesn't mean that more people are now living there. I can understand that thing. Well, husband and wives are now living. Okay, fine. But now you've just forced one part of the, of the customer base to subsidize the other part of the customer base. That should not be a housing issue. Where I house my car should not be a housing issue. So let's see what John says. I agree with your father. Just every equal and there won't be a Exactly. And, and you know, I'll tell you something. If you read that, if you read the book, and I highly recommend, it's just great. Richard Rothstein just cuts right to the chase. Basically, what they said is before FHA, before the government, the federal government really started getting into the housing and, and these rules, Everybody lived together. One guy cites this example that he had, you know, he was Jewish and the girl next door was white and she had a black boyfriend and they just lived all there. And all of a sudden, federal government comes in, starts creating neighborhoods. Oh, the white people have to be there and the black people have to be over there. Had they just left us alone and they just let us live our lives. Instead of some bureaucrat, and I blame it all. I know if, 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 if we're going to find blame, and I didn't mean to do this. One son of a bitch, Woodrow Wilson. Boy, that guy was a racist. He was from the deep south. He was, he was bad. That's why uh, Princeton had to change the name of their uh, buildings. Took off the Woodrow Wilson Public Affairs, whatever, whatever it was called. That guy was bad. Well, he was terrible. Terrible. All right, let's see what John says. And this city needs an additional 59 units. John, John, they got to do something. They got to do something, John. Um, they're not going to be able to do it if they keep, if they're not going to be able to get those 1,500 units in there on an affordable basis or even barely affordable basis if they still keep those same type of requirements. And that's why this, this um, particular uh, lobbying group has come into existence for towns like yours. John, Shoot me an email, charles at dobbinslaw.com. Shoot me an email uh, so that I, if I come across that, that on uh, the name of that uh, entity, I'll shoot it back to you. You can go check them out. When I heard about them, uh, I was shocked. It was like, what? What? There's a, there's a lobbying group for to get rid of parking? That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. And then when I started thinking about it and reading more about it, oh, I get it. I absolutely get it. And that, that sundial property in Minneapolis is a great example of how you just, uh, it, it's a burden on us owner owner operators of, of multifamily property. So, all right, that was it. I'm sticking to it. I hope you got folks all enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, Francis. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and it really shouldn't be a social justice cause treating people the same no matter who you are should not be a cause it should just be the way you live um all right good
Thanks, everybody. It's great to see you all. For those of you that uh, are listening, that are um, uh, in my Monday night or, or my Monday night call, uh, that group, you are welcome to join us on the um, on the uh, hotel to apartment cohort call, uh, which will be happening in just uh, twenty minutes, twenty three minutes. And uh, that's because we had a holiday this Monday, and I postponed that uh, call. So everybody can jump on over to, to listen in on how we're doing with our hotel deals. Uh, very exciting. And um, and what else do we have going on? Uh, no, I don't have uh, my webinar is going to be um, uh, put up. Molly will know better than I as to when it's going to be um, uh, posted up. And it's uh, everybody can listen to it. It's all about business and uh, building your own multifamily real estate investing business. Uh, and if you can't do it yourself, I can certainly help. That's what I've been doing for years. So um, other than that, folks, great talk with you. I hope you enjoyed this one. I'm gonna try, and I'll hopefully see you Tuesday. I think it's it, uh, Molly. Is it 2 or 3 p.m. Eastern time? I, I can never remember. Mo Molly just tells me where to go. Um, whether, uh, and that's going to 3 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday. This is going to be the multifamily, multifamily law school. And if you have any topics, let me know. And I will, I will prepare and I will, yeah, look at that. That's cool. Uh, I will prepare and I will have it um, ready to go. Uh, I'll have your, your law school lecture prepared for you on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Everything is Eastern time. The world revolves around Eastern time. All right, everybody. Great to see you all. And I will talk to you soon.